So welcome to uh, Throw Away Your Xbox. The future of games is written in React. And uh, I want to get something right off the bat. Don't throw away your Xbox. Let's start with that. Uh, it's OK to like multiple things. You can like both pizza and pineapple and eat them at the same time. Um, you can code on a Mac and have an Android phone. That's fine. You can game on more than one platform. And with that out of the way, um, do any of you know this game? Apex Legends? Yeah, some of you do. Uh, and if you don't, that's fine. Uh, Wikipedia defines it as a free-to-play battle royale hero first-person shooter or something. It doesn't really matter. If you don't know what any of that means, uh, it's fine. It's just like any other game. You have a gun and you shoot at stuff. Um, so I wanted to play this with my wife. Uh, and to get the ball rolling, I sent her a message over on Facebook. Um, with the link to the Steam store of the game. The Steam is kind of like the app store for uh, games on PC. Um, and it's fine, it's like it's a free game, she doesn't need to buy it. So she goes online to, for, to, the, to the Steam page and she adds it to her library. Um, and then she logs into the, her Steam client and wait, her Steam client needs to update first. Fine. And she, the, the Steam client updates. And now she can download the game. It's about 67 gigabytes, but that's fine. We have a, a fast internet connection, so it will be a few hours. But eventually, the game will download, and she can run it and pick her favorite character, Billie Eilish. And then we're in the game shooting at stuff. And my question is, uh, can we do better? So let me show you something. This is a game called Venge.io. I'm pretty bad at this, so just a heads up. Okay. Okay, so like I told you, but I mean, how cool is that, right? In the seconds we're in the game. Thank you so much. OK, fine, fine. I have more slides. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Offer. I've been playing guitar uh, for over 20 years, which isn't relevant for this talk, but I do have this cool picture, so it's a good excuse to use it. Uh, I've been programming for more than 23, and I've been playing video games for way, way longer than that. Um, in my day-to-day, -day, I'm a senior developer at a company called Echo, uh, where we use interactive video um, to reshape how e-commerce feels and behaves online. And during the past 10 years or so, I've created many, many, many interactive games and experiences, all if not, uh, most if not all of them, with web technology. Um, and uh, one thing I'm particularly proud of is this uh, open source project called Lance, which allows, enables people to make multiplayer real-time games in JavaScript uh, a little bit easier. And I did everything, everything you just, you just saw because I was lazy. I mean, you have to understand, I started making websites back in the days when they took to YouTube like this. Um, and I mean, I knew how to do everything with JavaScript, right? I knew HTML and CSS, and I figured, why learn uh, something new when I can use the same knowledge to do something that I already wanted to do, which is to make games. And I know, I know I'm not the only one, who had the, this thought. Uh, you, sir, what's your name? Krosta. Krosta also had the same idea, right? One day, someday, I'll make my own game. So I'm here to show you that you can make web games today, but not like today, today, because there was a conference and there's stuff going on, and you have a busy schedule, but like someday when you have the time and you're available. And I know your next thought is going to be uh, the web wasn't made for games, to which I counter, uh, neither was it made for other things like, you know, email or banking or video or social networks or using ChatGPT as your therapist. But people still do that, right? Okay. And I mean, games are a thing. In uh, 2021, if you look at the global 
uh, games market cap, so how much many games made, they made $175 billion. And you've seen this, right? It's everywhere. There are gaming keyboards, and there are gaming mice, and there are gaming chairs, and there are gaming diapers. Okay, there aren't gaming diapers, I made it up. But like, it could totally happen, right? I grew up in an era where I had the choice between a beige keyboard and an off-white keyboard. But today, you can get uh, a Tommy Hilfiger keyboard. <laughs> that's an actual product you can buy today. And if that's too mundane for you, uh, that's fine. You can get the Gucci Xbox if you have like $10,000 to spare. Anyhow, my point with all of this is that uh, games are big. And it's not just uh, like all types of games are big. So if you look at like the same global mic games by sector, so you have you know, your PC games and your console games and whatever, but browser games or web games are this sliver up the top, still $2.6 billion in 2021. So yeah, there, there's not just fun to be had with games, but that's an actual business. But I keep saying web games. Um, what are web games really? And to answer this question, we need to look into kind of the evolution of games or web games throughout the time. Let me show you some examples. So the earliest one I could find is this little gem. And it's, uh, it's like a puzzle game that you play against a computer and you need to win more blue uh, squares, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. The interesting thing here is all of this is server side. You see, all of this is CGI bin. Some poor soul probably wrote this in Perl. Um, and one person in the other audience got that joke. I'm happy. Um, but it's all like server side. This doesn't even have CSS. It's just like the client sending commands to the server, and that's it. And if you wanted to do something fancier, then you had to use an applet like Java. So uh, what are applets? I know this is really, really old stuff, uh, but essentially, before the browser could do it, the cool things it could do today, um, applets were this way to include a, an external runtime in the browser. So basically, you assigned a place, a physical space in the browser, and a, a different program that you had to install uh, ran, actually ran the content. So if you didn't have this installed, you'd see this. And if, if you did have this installed, then every two days, you'd get this. Uh, I don't know what they did in those two days, because but they couldn't possibly add new features, so but I don't know. One of the um, popular games at the time, though, was uh, RuneScape, which was kind of like a precursor to World of Warcraft. Yeah. So it looked kind of like this. It was like a multiplayer RPG sort of thing. You had your character, you killed monsters, uh, you got loot. And that's like pretty impressive, considering it started in, in 1998, right? On the web. Um, and we had other applets as well, like there was Java, but there was also, uh, I don't know, uh, Silverlight for like one second. Um, and then we had Flash, which really picked up in uh, 1999, since uh, Windows XP kind of bundled it and forced everyone to use it anyhow. And you've probably seen or played Flash games. There were millions of those out there. Uh, and I'm not even exaggerating, it was just all over the web. And you've probably seen or played some or any of these for, for, and for good reasons. I mean, the golden age of Flash game around uh, 2005 uh, was uh, really something to see. And it was because this was a new medium for self-expression. Finally, you could put something, something interactive on the web with relatively little effort uh, and have, you know, Many people see it, and you didn't have to go through like a publisher or something to get it out there. You could just like put it on IRC or ICQ or send an email to someone, and millions of people could see it by going to sites like uh, Newgrounds or Congregate or something like that. And it was all like neatly packaged uh, in one thing. You had a flash editor, and it exported one file, and it could do the graphics, the animations, the programming, everything. And in one neat place. And then 2007 came along with it, the iPhone, uh, and uh, Steve Jobs, like in an open letter, said, listen, I don't think the future of uh, Flash is 
is fits my vision for the mobile web. And from there started the slow death of Flash. Uh, you know, uh, it, we had good times, we had some bad times. By the way, if you search for the death of Flash on YouTube, you don't get exactly what you wanted. I learned that recently. While all of this was happening, a lot of new web technologies were emerging. So in 2005, we got Canvas, and then we got Web Core Creators, and WebGL, and all sorts of interesting stuff. This May, Chrome Shift Web GPU, which is a really cool new technology for uh, rendering stuff in the web. Uh, I need an entire new talk to explain what it does and why is it different from, web, uh, from WebGL, but uh, trust me in this. Um, and along this thing, um, we get games like Angar.io, which is a, a game in which you, are, you play this blob. Let's see if this works. And the idea is for you to eat other small blobs and bigger blobs eat you. Uh, and I know it's kind of silly, uh, and it looks kind of simple, but this thing, oh my god, <laughs> this thing exploded. Uh, there were clones of it, and like uh, mobile versions of it, and all sorts of uh, um, um, people played and talked about this, and this was the precursor to I.O. games, uh, which are like what we call modern web games. I.O., by the way, sounds like input-output. It is actually the top-level domain for the Indian Ocean. Go figure. Um, cool. So my definition for web games, my personal definition, is games that are play playable in the browser and are implemented with standardized web technology. And I mean, OK, what's so special about web games then? First of all, like you just saw, they're on the web. You just put a URL without downloading anything, without logging into anything. You're just there within seconds, which is pretty cool. But there are other uh, things that make web games special. First of all, novel interactivity that you can't get anywhere else. Um, let me give you an example of that. This is a, a rather old experiment by Google, but still pretty cool, called Racer. And the idea is this. You load it up on physical devices, on the browsers of physical devices, and every player gets a car, and you race across the different devices. The devices, the game is linked physically to the screens. So like your car zips across the different screens, and you connect, I think, up to four different devices. And look, it's an old, an old iPad talking to an old Samsung phone. Like You can't do that with any other platform. How cool is that? Another thing why I think uh, web games are so cool is that many of them kind of follow the idea of rapid prototyping. And I'll give you an example. Like, if you develop something, you wouldn't like develop a half-baked half game and upload it to the Switch store, right? Um, the whole idea of working fast, doing iteration, uploading, it's a thing that we did originally on the web before the concept got stolen and turned into TikTok. Um, and that's, that's kind of like what we do on the web. Let me show you how, what people uh, uh, did with this mentality. This is an experiment called Slow Roads. Um, and the idea here is that Henslow played with doing generative art and uh, ended up creating this beautiful like driving simulator on an endless road. Let's see if uh... that, that's why they say you need to keep your hand, uh, head, uh, your your eyes on the road. And you can see that I can even use uh, like a, a gamepad API to control it. Which is, you know, again, pretty cool, the amazing stuff that you can do just on the web. And you can just like drive anywhere, and you can drive in winter, and you can try to drive a bus. It's much less fun than a car, I have to admit. Uh, but I mean, this isn't a full fledged game, even though it's very polished. It's just a cool experience that you can have online. So, one thing that's super important about web games is because they're on the web, they're way easier to make accessible. So, native games are notoriously uh, not as accessible as we'd like them to be. But if you ha are on the web, you're already on your way to making it more accessible. I know that everyone here is great, and we're all writing proper semantic DOM, and we're using buttons instead of divs. 
because uh, everyone here is great. Um, but other than that, the web allows things like uh, easily doing alternative input methods, like using keyboard for forms and using touch screens and using corresponding devices or supporting assistive tech like screen readers and magnifiers or using, letting the user to control the font manually. So if you follow uh, best accessibility practices, your game is already on the way to becoming way more accessible. And let's talk about the elephant in the room. This is a game called The Elephant in the Room. Um, is JavaScript the proper way to make games? I mean, think about it. You have the JavaScript runtime, and that runs in tab space along your thousand other tabs that you have open. And that runs in the browser, which is an app, along with tons of other apps. And that runs on the OS, and only that has access to the hardware. So, like, is JavaScript the proper way to make games? Look at the distance between where you write the game and where it runs. So maybe JavaScript isn't the obvious choice because like, it's a scripting language, so it's uncompiled, it's like, uh, assessed in real time, it's single-threaded, you have no direct memory access, and like, you're at the mercy of the garbage collector, you have no direct hardware access, and every browser implements it differently, uh, especially if you're on different devices or if you're on mobile. But then again, we have amazing technologies on the web. We have technologies for logic and updates and for rendering, and for input, and for persistency, and performance, and networking, and you know all of this really, really cool tech. But technology, even as good as it gets, doesn't guarantee a good game. Uh, you know this guy? His name is Shigeru Miyamoto. And he created a famous, very famous game uh, called 1080 snowboarding for the N64. And he also created Mario. Um, and he, he says this quote, you can use a lot of different technologies to create something that doesn't really have a lot of value. And I, I wholeheartedly believe in that. Point in, point in case, Prince of Persia. This is a game released 1989 for the Apple II. It had groundbreaking tech at the time. Uh, like rotoscoped images and graphics that weren't seen before. Uh, true, it has cringy box art for 2023, um, but still, brilliant game, even today, even if you play it today, and you can play it today, even in the browser. This is a port of Prince of Persia uh, in JavaScript. This is the sound triggered you, right? What I specifically like about this is the health is a query parameter, so you can just <laughs> change that, which is way easier when, when and I played it in like 1991 or something. Um, cool. So another point in case, JS13K is a competition for making games in JavaScript and in less than 13K. All of the game, the sound, graphics, whatever. And you ask yourself, OK, what can you make with just 13K? React itself like weighs two megabytes, right? Um, so have a look. This is Q13K. What about like a complete uh, first-person shooter? All of this under 13K. Yeah? So you might be asking, like, OK, but like we have Unity and Unreal Engines, the de facto software that you use to make games, and they export for the web. Why just not use them? But in honest, like these, what they do is export uh, like to WASM, or which is like a binary format, or uh, like JavaScript that kind of looks like this. Uh, in like to which I ask, at this point, is this are these web games? And I mean, I'm not trying to gatekeep anyone, but like to me, if you can't easily use the exact same web technology that you'd use to build a website, I don't know. And I know, I know what you're thinking. Isn't this a talk about React? Where are we getting to the React part? I'm, I'm getting there, trust me. And to answer that, uh, let me ask you, what is a game? But not like in the philosophical sense. We don't have time for that. Um, essentially, a game is input coming from some peripheral, 
the game loop, which controls the game itself, uh, like logic, state, uh, physics, whatever happens in the world, and then some sort of output. And turns out, React is brilliant at doing just that, getting inputs, doing some sort, of some sort of logic, and then output. Output, for example, could be, I don't know, audio. Take a look at, the, at this hook from uh, Josh Como, use sound. You want to add sound to your React app, you import the hook, you input the file, and you have like a callback that you can use to call a sound. Simple. And now, if you wanted to output video, or like something that paints pixels, then you'd need a render. And you already know a render. You've been working it with it every day. It's called HTML and CSS. And if you can make websites with it, you can make games with it. This is a game called Athena Crisis by Christoph Nakazawa. Uh, and everything that you see here is HTML and CSS. It's sort of like a turn-based uh, strategy game in the style of advanced war, if anyone knows that. And his, in his recent talk from uh, Reactathon 2020, he shows how like, the outline for the characters, for example, is just CSS drop shadow. How cool is that? And I mean, think about it. React, um, React and the DOM aren't even the same library. Like the whole thing with messing with the DOM is in React DOM. React can do a whole lot more. It's not just limited to DOM rendering. There are renderers like Pixie uh, and its React binding, React Pixie for 2D rendering, which allows you to um, change sprites, move sprites, add effects, and all sorts of stuff which is what you'd want in a renderer. And then you have 3D renderers, like 3JS or Babylon.js. So one option would be rendering the uh, game with like the 2D or 3D rendering, so the game world with the engine, and then using HTML and CSS for the UI. For example, this is a game called Summoners.io. It's like a card game like Hearthstone or Magic of the Gathering. And here you can see that this interface is just HTML and CSS. And then when you get into the game, um, it's like the game itself is rendered with uh, Babylon. And again, the interface is React. So you can kind of mix, mix and match because UI is really easy to make on the web rather than you know, in, a, in a gaming engine, which is really cool. Now, 3GS is the other popular 3D engine, uh, which you've, you've seen probably in any other 3D experience on the web. And when you take 3JS and React, you get React Free Fiber, which is a library that basically does binding between React and uh, 3GS. And let me show you the Hello World kind of example for this, which is, let's see, internet, please work. OK. So what you're going to see is two rotating cubes on the side here. Uh, and you can change them, control them. If you click them, they grow bigger or smaller. And everything here is just React. So there's a component for box, which is a functional component, which you can you know, edit the uh, props of. And the state is managed with use state that you already know. So how easy it is to transition from doing basically DOM to doing 3D. Cool, and you could do other crazy things with it. This is a game in React Free Fiber. I drive better in real life, like I, I promise. Um, and uh, the code for that, by the way, is up on a code sandbox. You can just play with that. It's open source. React Free Fiber has an extensive ecosystem with component libraries and all sorts of stuff, which some of this I'm going to show now. Uh, one of the cool things is post processing, which is like doing effects on top of stuff. So on top of the rendering, so you see this like blur and these uh, different lights. They are just components that you can disable. Whatever here, I'm disabling the depth of field effect. On top of that, like the halo, the light halo, is this bloom effect. Uh, and again, it's a component that you can add and play with, open source. Um, 
GLTF JSX, which kind of sounds like a curse. Uh, as, <laughs> let me explain this. GLTF is the format for uh, 3D files, is a format for 3D files. Um, JSX, you already know, uh, still sounds like a curse. Um, and it's a, a, a tool that lets you convert between one and the other. So you get your model, you convert it to GLTF, like you export it to GLTF, and then you run this command line util, which outputs JSX. So now your, uh, your 3D model is JSX that you can play with. You can actually play with it. So take, oh, like take, take a look at this shoe, for example, just copied that JSX, and now I can edit properties in real time to create the ugliest shoe someone has ever created. But it's just playing around with JSX that you already know. Um, and there's other cool and interesting stuff in the space. Um, Triplex is a 3D editor for React 3 uh, Fiber. So it looks like a regular editor, but what it does is essentially saves to JSX. So it edits code the same way you'd edit it, I don't know, in Visual Studio or WebStorm. Uh, no judgment either way. Um, but uh, it saves to JSX, so essentially by doing this, you're editing code. It's a new product and in beta, but just the promise of these tools is super, super cool. So, okay, doing that is really cool. Where do you even start? So the first recent resource I should suggest is um, webgamedev.com, should be IEO, not .com, that's my bad. Uh, it has tutorials and guides and links to a lot of this and other cool stuff. It's also a Discord community, very supportive Discord community where people show what they've done and support each other, a really good place to start. There's this channel, the Game Makers Toolkit on YouTube, which isn't specific to React or web games, but it's interesting about games in general. And specifically, there's a series there about creating your first game. Uh, Mark Brown, the creator, does his, creates his first games and comes across obstacles and talks about how he overcame them. If you need, like uh, you can start on your own and you need like some guidance or like a um, uh, task to get you moving forward. There are jams, game jams, which are sort of like hackathons for games. Uh, the global game jam and the London there are the big ones. They're a little far off, uh, but just this Saturday, it was announced that there is a new React jam, uh, a game jam specific to React games and it's on July and it has really cool prizes. I'm not affiliated with it or anything. I just saw it and thought it was a good timing uh, for this talk. Um, so that's a way to get the ball moving. You don't have to finish the game that you're making, uh, but it's a good uh, excuse to start it. My tip for starting out, um, don't start with 2D. Don't start with 3D, start with 2D. Um, and I'll give you an, an analogy for that. So like if someone comes up to you and says, hey, um, I want to learn HTML, your first response definitely should not be, cool. First, you need to spool up a Kubernetes cluster and then uh, deploy Kafka, right? It's to start with a smaller scope just to get your legs in. Um, web games are amazing, I hope that I got you a little taste of what I can give you in these 30 minutes. Uh, thank you so much.